church uh, because that drives every single thing that we do here at Victory Church. And this has been our mission statement for many years now. Uh, and everything that we do, uh, <clears throat> we try to fit it. If it doesn't fit within this mission statement, then we don't do it, but we try to fit it within this mission statement. So I'm going to spend the next several Sundays unpacking this, and together I want us to recite and say our mission statement. It's on the screen for you. You have it memorized. It's on the front of your shirt. I'll say more about that in just a moment, but let's say it together. The mission statement of Victory Church is simply this. What? Love God, love others, pass our faith to the next generation. That's it. Now, it's easier to say than it is to live out and do, right? But love God, first and foremost. Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. That's the first thing that we're to do. And then we're to love others. I'll talk more about that next Sunday. Uh, we're to love one another. And then we are to pass our faith to the next generation. So that's our threefold mission statement. Uh, and pretty much everything that we do here at Victory Church falls within that. So I wanted to just unpack that again for us oh, in this first series. And today we're going to be talking about how we love God, right? How we can show God that we love Him. And I'm going to try to unpack that thought here in just a moment. But... do, I want us to do something here. We all wore our victory shirts, right? Our mission statement shirts. And uh, here's what I want us to do. I want you to get up. Let's bring the house lights up. I want you to get up. I want you to walk around one with another. I want you to take some selfies with your neighbor and those around you and try to get your shirt in there if you can and get somebody to take your pictures and let's high five one another and let's welcome one another and let's talk with one another a little bit. And, and we're going to give you a little block of time to do that, but I want you to take some selfies, okay? Now with those selfies, I want you to post those to your social media, okay? And I want you to be sure anytime you post anything with Victory Church, Church, be sure that you use hashtag Victory Church O'Fallon. Then we can go on any, any post, search for that hashtag, and all the pictures of Victory Church O'Fallon is going to come up, okay? So get your phones out, have fun with this, interact one with another. This is time for you to get up and mingle some and uh, welcome each other to church on this Sunday morning, and be sure to take some selfies of yourself with your shirt, okay? So go ahead and do that. Put us on a little bit of music here. Victory Church, which is simply love God, love others, and pass our faith to the next generation. Now, if you have attended our Discovering Victory Church membership class that we call Class 101, a lot of this material, or some of this material, I've got some new stuff I'm going to share with you, but some of this material we cover in that class because it's important that as we are working together in ministry, it's important that we're all going and trying to reach and obtain the same goal, right? Uh, we all need to be rowing the boat, and we need to be rowing the boat in the right direction so that we can reach our goal together. And that's kind of the purpose of our mission statement. And by the way, I will say once again, everybody needs to be rowing the boat. And what I simply mean by that is there, that there is a ministry in the church for everybody, and everybody needs to get plugged into the ministry of the church. We need a ministry in the church, and we need a mission in the world. And you've heard me talk about that in the past. But here's what I believe. If everybody is involved rowing the boat, then we don't have a whole lot of time to rock the boat. Right? Hello? If we're all rowing the boat, we don't have a whole lot of time to rock the boat. And usually when the boat starts rocking, there's somebody that's not rowing. Hello? Say amen or roll me, but that's not my message today at all. 
Uh, I just want to throw that in there. But we need to learn to love God. Now, within this mission statement, we pull this mission statement out of three passages of Scripture. Uh, out of Matthew chapter 22, out of Matthew chapter 29, out of Deuteronomy chapter number 6. That's what we pull this mission statement out of. Now, I'm not going to go and read all of those passages of Scripture. You can go to johnlcannon.com, and there's the sermon notes, and it has all these Scripture references there. Or just use your phone and take a picture of the, uh, of the screen. Or just use your Logos Bible software app. The Scripture pops up for you, and you can click and take a note there. And uh, so, so many ways that we, you can engage in what we're trying to do here at Victory Church. But this is, these are the Scripture references that we pull these three phrases from. Loving God, loving others, and passing our faith to the next generation. Now, we're going to simply talk about loving God and really what this important commandment. What do you think was the, is the most important commandment in the entire Word of God? Now, I want you to think about all of them. There's more than just 10, right? We have the 10 commandments, right, that, that the Lord gave the people of Israel, and, and uh, we, we have those, right? And most of us can probably recite those from memory. We understand what those are. But then there's a lot of other commands that the Lord wants us to carry out and live and do it, over in the New Testament. I mean, just think about the, uh, the one another's, how we're to love one another and care for one another and minister to one another and bear one another's burdens. I mean, all of those are commands in Scripture. So let me ask you, of all the commands in Scripture, what would you think would be the most important commandment in all of Scripture? Well, there was a guy in the New Testament. Somebody said it. You're right. You're ahead of me there, but good job. Uh, there was a guy in the New Testament that was thinking about that. And so we pick up the story in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, and verse 34 and following. The Scripture says this, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. And one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question, right? Now here you have this religious guy that is an expert in the Old Testament law. And he thought, man, I, I've got him here. I'm going to trip him up with this question that I'm going to ask him. And he says in verse number 36, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Which one is the most important commandment in the law of Moses. Now I want you to notice in verse number 37. It does not say that Jesus stuttered. It does not say that Jesus said, man, that's a great question. Let me go talk to the Father and see if I can figure this one out. He doesn't say, let me get back with you on that, right? He doesn't say, well, let me search them and pray over them and Maybe the Father will reveal to me what... No, immediately. Jesus replied immediately in verse number 37. And his reply was this. You must... Everybody say, love the Lord. Love. You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Now, does that passage of Scripture, does that statement sound familiar to us? It does. If you read the Old Testament, you know that that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 which is the last part of our mission statement of passing our faith to the next generation. But in that, it's called, the Jewish people call this the Shema. Okay? As a matter of fact, for every Jewish boy, this was probably the very first passage of Scripture that they would put to memory, that they would memorize. So Jesus, as a young lad, right, being brought up in the Jewish customs, he apparently had, of course, he's God, right? So, but I'm talking about his man side, right? 100% God, 100% man. I'm talking about his humanity, his, his man side. He was taught this scripture as a young boy. And he had put it to memory. And he knew what the greatest commandment in all of scripture is and was. What is it? That we love God with all of our heart. We love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. And he says in verse number 38, that this is the first, everybody say first. This is the first and greatest, everybody say greatest. greatest. So this commandment is the first and greatest commandment. Wow, that needs to resonate in our spirit. We need to restore that in our memory. We need to get a hold of that. 
Jesus said that loving God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, is not the second, but the first and greatest commandment in Scripture. And then he said in verse number 39, and the second is equally important, and this is where we get the second part of our mission statement, is what? We love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Interesting. We'll unpack that next week, hopefully, if I get there, okay? That you love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says something interesting in verse 40. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. If you think about that, all of the laws, matter of fact, when you think about the Ten Commandments, you'll know that in, in the Ten Commandments there are ways that we honor God and then ways that we honor our, our fellow man. There are ways that we love God and ways that we love our fellow man. And they're really broken down in the Ten Commandments. I don't have time to unpack that. But all of the commands in Scripture, Jesus is saying the entire Levitical law and all the demands of the prophets, minor and major prophets, right, are based on these two commandments. To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So today I want to try to talk to you and share with you on how we can show our love for God, right? Love God dash extreme worship, kind of the title of my message today. Now, we all, do we not, enjoy watching extreme sports, right? You think about all the extreme sports that we watch on TV and probably more so on YouTube, but there's a reason why we like to watch these extreme sports. Why is that? Well, because they're exciting because they they involve danger, right? I mean, when you think about the extreme sports that these men and women do, it involves a great amount of danger in their own life to do some of these extreme sports. And we like to watch these extreme sports. And so in preparing for this idea that I had in my mind about love God, that equals extreme worship, I thought about extreme sports. And so I spent some time on YouTube checking out all the extreme sports. Now, here's one of the things I found. There are more videos on unsuccessful attempts than there are on successful attempts in these extreme sports. I mean, it was hard for me to find one that was successful in what they were doing. I mean, all, it seemed like all the videos of them crashing and burning, right, and trying to do what they were doing. You can have a good time, and that's enjoyable to sit and kind of do that. So that was part of my research this week. I want you to watch this video on some extreme sports. I think I can do that one. Woo! This is pretty cool. No way. Uh-uh. Nope. Hold your breath, guys. Mm -mm. Possible. No way. Look, watch this. This is crazy. Boom. Ninja. And you can find videos like that over and over again out there on YouTube. And I think that's pretty amazing. All the extreme events and sports that are out there that all of these people, they push their bodies to the limits 
to do some of these things. Well, that's odd to us, right? To think that we would do that. Now, we like to watch it, but very few of us would probably enjoy participating in those, right? Uh, we're, we're at we're, we're odd. We're, we're wowed by some of the things that we see these people doing here. And why is that? Well, I believe one of the reasons that we live in a risk awareness culture, right? I mean, we kind of try our best every day to minimize some of the risk in our own personal life so that we can live a safe and, and free life. So we go to great lengths to minimize the risk in our life. We, we go to great lengths in doing that. I mean, safety is a major focus in our life, right? I mean, we're very concerned about that on a daily basis, and we don't really want to put our bodies at risk like some of these people do in some of these amazing sports and things and activities that they do. I mean, you think about it, we have insurance and protection plans out there that help us minimize all the different risk that we may fall into in our life. I mean, there's insurance for everything. Guys, do you realize that there is even, I mean, obviously there's insurance. I don't know how many, how many of you guys have insurance on your phones? I mean, there's insurance you can get on your phones, obviously for your car and, and for your house and things. But do you realize that there's insurance you can get for these little things? These key fobs for your car, right? I mean, they're expensive when you go to replace them. And, and there's insurance that you can get to kind of protect and minimize the risk of losing this or it getting damaged. You can get insurance on that. You can get insurance on them. Some of you guys may have this. I don't know. If you don't and you have them, you may want to think about it pet insurance and insurance for your dogs. I mean, you ever put your dog in one of those animal hospitals? How are you going to pay out some cash? And so there's all different things that we do to try to minimize the risk and live in safety in the life that we live in. We live in this risk awareness culture. But here's something that I want you to see here. Life is not risk free. Are you with me? I want you to see that life is not risk free. And I also want you to see that following Jesus can be very risky, right? Now, I'm going to unpack that thought through this message this morning. But the thing I want you to see is that life is not, everybody say not, it's not risk-free. I mean, we can put a lot of safeties in our life to try to minimize a lot of the risk, but life in and of itself is not completely risk-free. Do you guys, do you realize that every single one of you took a risk this morning when you left your house and you got behind an automobile and, and you drove to church this morning? There was a risk that you took in getting here, right? Now, there's some safety things that you put in play as well. One, maybe, possibly, you put on a seatbelt. I don't know. I hate those things, right? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. It's the law. We should all wear our seatbelts, right? Help minimize the risk. But sometimes I don't want to wear one, right? You ever like that? And Debbie got a new car. That car will beep the entire time. I mean, obnoxiously annoying sound until you put your seatbelt on. Now, my Tahoe... It'll go beep, 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 like five times, it'll stop. And then it'll go beep, 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 about five more times, it'll stop, and that's it. It's like, okay, I told you, if you're dumb enough not to wear it, that's you. <laughs> right? So I like that about my car, my Tahoe, right? It kind of warns me, but then, hey, it's yours, you do what you want to do. Not so with some of these newer vehicles, right? They're telling you, hey, dummy, minimize the risk put on your seatbelt. The point I'm trying to make is that life is not risk-free, right? We, we're faced with different risks every single day. And also, following Jesus can be very risky. For example, you know, we think about these extreme sport videos, and when bringing extreme into our spiritual life, sometimes we hesitate, right? It's one thing to be extreme in some sporting events and things of videos like I just showed you. That's one thing. But whenever we as a whole think about bringing that whole idea of being extreme into our spiritual life, in the way that we love God, sometimes we hesitate. We're like, well, maybe that's a little bit too, finish it for me, extreme. Right? Maybe that's a little bit too far. I think I may take a back seat on this one. Maybe some of you thought this morning, everybody wearing their mission t-shirts to church, maybe that's a little too extreme, right? I don't know if anybody had that idea or not, but we do that. We put limits on what, how far we're going to go in our walk with 
the Lord. But here's what I want you to see. This is kind of the, the premise of my entire message. To love God is to engage in extreme worship. Now, I'll unpack that for you in just a moment of what that looks like. But this is what I want you to get. The first part of our mission statement is to love God. And if we're going to love God, then we've got to understand that we are going to have to engage in some extreme worship in the way that we love God, in the way that we're showing Him that we love Him. For many people, the idea of extreme worship probably brings a deep seated fear, maybe a little bit of anxiety. Maybe we think, well, that may be too extreme. I'm a reserved. You may be thinking, it's not me. I'm definitely not a reserved guy. You may be thinking, I'm a reserved kind of guy. I'm a reserved kind of gal. I just like to kind of sit here and not be seen. And if that's so, that's okay. But even in your worship experience, even in your relationship with the Lord, even in your duty of loving God and carrying that out, I think we've got to entertain the idea of some extreme worship. Now, there's an example in the Bible of this lady that exemplified extreme worship. There was this family in the Bible that invited Jesus over for dinner. Now, it was the week before he was going to be crucified. There was a large gathering at this household. And they invited Jesus over for this dinner that they wanted to have with him. The story is found, you need to reference this, the story is found in John's Gospel, chapter 12. Right? Guys, you realize I just got out of my introduction? <laughs> and I'm headed into this message, right? Woo, things are looking up for 2023, all right? Matter of fact, you don't see my notes here, but I got a big, bold line, introduction done. <laughs> There's this family that had this amazing idea to invite Jesus over for dinner, right? We pick up the story in John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 1, down through verse number 8. Let's read this. I'm going to read it for you, just so we can put it all in context. Then I want to unpack this a little bit, and then I'm going to share with you four ways that this individual showed that she was going to worship the Lord her God, that she was going to love God, even if it was at the level of being extreme for those that were in the household and those that were around. She engaged in extreme worship which is what I think we can learn some things from this individual and apply it to our own lives. Let's look at the story. John 12, verse 1, down through verse number 8. Now, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and Scripture says this. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man that he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Oh, wait a minute, just stop. Just think about that. Here Jesus now is, at one point this man Lazarus was dead. Jesus spoke him back into existence, right? Mary and Martha were all ex upset and weeping and crying because he had, had died and Jesus was late in getting there. Side note, Jesus is never late in showing up in your life, right? We may think he's a little late, but he's always right on time, honey. You can take that to the bank. And he showed up and he brought Lazarus back. Now... Jesus is walking into this house of this man that was dead that's now alive and having dinner. That whole scenario in and of itself just kind of blows me away, right? So here they are. Dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Now Martha served. Am I at the right passage in verse number two? Here we go. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor, and Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Verse three. And then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair, and the house was, everybody say filled. The house was filled with this fragrance. We're going to talk about that more in just a moment. But Judas is scared in verse number four. The disciple who would soon, everybody say betray, Get this in, in the thought process. In this picture, Jesus is walking into this household where they had prepared a dinner for him in his honor. Lazarus was there, who once was dead, now alive, eating at the table. Crazy, right? 
But also in there was this lady that had purchased this oil and had, had this expensive perfume of essence, oil of essence of nard, anointing his feet, wiping his feet with her hair, filled, with the, filled the house with that fragrance. And in that same house, there is Judas. Everybody knows who Judas is, right? He's the one at this particular time had already set up the betrayal of Jesus, had already been paid for his betrayal that he was. So we've got a naysayer already in the group, right? That's there for that, that audience in that dinner for Jesus's honor. You got Judas there. I just want you to, I'm trying to paint the picture of what's going on here. Now that perfume was worth, everybody say a year's wages, that 12 ounce bottle of perfume was a lot of money. It was a year's wages. And it should have been sold. Now, this is Judas saying. Judas rises up and he says this in verse 5 that perf perfume was worth a year's wages. And it should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Really, Judas? I mean,. You're a thief. You're a liar. You're a coward. And you're going to stand up and try to be the man of character and principle here? And there's a whole other message I could go there, but I'm not. I'm going to stay away from that. Verse 6, not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Verse 7, Jesus replied to Judas, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. And then he said in verse 8, You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. What a great story that we find this dinner for Jesus with Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Judas, many others in there having this dinner for the Lord Jesus. This family wanted to have a dinner in his honor. In that dinner process, while everyone else was busy and getting prepared for the dinner and starting to eat, Mary takes this vial of expensive nard oil perfume. She poured it on his feet. Then she took her hair and the tears that she was weeping at the feet of Jesus. She took her hair and started wiping the tears from his feet. Extreme, wouldn't you think? Odd, wouldn't you think? As a matter of fact, if you find this shocking, you're not alone. Everyone in the household, except Jesus, thought this was a little extreme. But you want me to tell you something? Mary loved Jesus. She engaged in extreme worship. We may balk on that a little bit. We may think, oh, I don't want to make a scene. We may think, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to go that far. I'm just, not there. I'm just not there yet in my spiritual walk with the Lord. You know, we make up all these excuses. But here's what I know. Mary loved Jesus. And because Mary loved Jesus, she engaged in this extreme Worship. You see, this wasn't normal behavior in first century, with, in first century Israel either. It wasn't normal behavior to take this 12-ounce bottle, a year's wages of perfume, and pour on someone. As a matter of fact, what was customary was to anoint their head with some oil, right? Anoint their head with some oil for the honored guest. And they would also provide water to wash the feet of those that enter the room. You didn't really wash somebody's feet by going to them and weeping and crying and the tears that you're weeping and crying you use to wash their feet. No, there was a basin of water that was there for you to wash their feet. So the naysayers in the crowd were probably saying, you know what? I don't know why she's doing all this. We don't anoint. We don't anoint the feet. We don't anoint all the body. We don't anoint all this stuff with oil. We don't even use that much. We just anoint the head for an honored guest of an individual. And we've got a basin of water there to wash the feet of whoever needs to be washed. What in the world is Mary doing? That's the talk and the rumor that's taken across through the family and through the church, if you will. What is she doing? Who is she? Why is she doing that? Can't you just hear it? Right? Can't you see it? 
You guys, you with me? I'm trying to bring you into this story. I'm trying to get you to the place where you can feel and see what was going on. Here's what I want you to know. Mary went beyond what was expected. Mary went beyond what was acceptable in that day to worship Jesus. Why? Because she loved the Lord. There is no doubt many of those at the dinner that day were shocked by her behavior. Possibly you yourself would have been shocked if you were there that day as well. Let me ask you this. Try to imagine yourself in that room. Let's put yourself in that room. You're in the household of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. You're there in that event. I want you to listen to the voices of the people that are having conversations over dinner. Listen to the, listen to the rustling of the plates and the, and the utensils, whatever it was they used. Listen to all of that that was taking place as they were having dinner. Listen to all the conversations that were taking place as people were talking over dinner. This one here and this one here and this one over here. Maybe somebody is asking more about Lazarus and how he felt when he was dead and now he's back to life. And, and it's, are, you, are you still hungry after you die? Maybe that was a conversation that was going on. Huh? I mean, I don't know, right? But we know Lazarus was there. I just want you to think about how busy the room was for this event when Jesus is there for dinner. Then I don't want you to just listen by using your ears. I want you to use your nose. I want you to start smelling. What's it smell like in here for dinner? Well, obviously, you smell the food, right? Oh, man. Whatever it was they were having for dinner smelled great. I mean, don't you love whenever you're going to eat? And I know when Debbie puts down the meal on the table and, and she's got a meal prepared for us for lunch today and she puts it on there and it's hot and it's steaming and it's sitting on the table and we're all gathered around. Just the smell alone is amazing. No doubt that same smell was here. They could smell all the food that had been prepared. But then all of a sudden, what's, what's that? What's that smell? Ah. That's a strange smell. Oh, my goodness. That's a beautiful smell. What is that? And they're now starting to be aware of what Mary is doing. But it came through them smelling this fragrance of nard oil. Now, all of a sudden, they're trying to find out where this smell is coming from. And they discover now, and they see with their eyes... Mary now at the feet of Jesus with this 12-ounce bottle of oil, extremely expensive. This bottle of oil would cost you a year's wages. She's pouring it on the feet of Jesus. Extreme. And now I want to ask you, what are your thoughts? As you see this, as you hear what's going on, as you smell what's taking place, and now you're an eyewitness, how would you respond? Maybe you would respond like, what is she doing? Right? Come on, don't get, don't get so spiritual on me right here. You would have probably said, just like myself, Mary, what are you doing? Right? You realize how much that's worth? Mary, that's a little extreme, don't you think? Come on, church, you with me? But then all of a sudden, we get to the point where maybe we would say, what did that cost? Mary, how much money are you pouring into this thing called worship? Mary, how much does that cost, that bottle of perfume? It's at this point now that Judas rises up, right? You see, we look at Judas, we think, boy, I can never align with him. We look at Judas, we think, man, I would never betray Jesus like Judas betrayed Jesus. However, if the truth be known, we're probably a little bit more like Judas than we are Mary when it comes to this thing called loving God and having extreme worship. Because right now, we're worried about the money. Right? I just don't think, I just don't think that's, we're going to get, now we're going to spiritualize it. 
I just don't think that's a good being a good steward of what God has placed in our possession. Right? We're going to spiritualize it. We're going to spin it. We're going to make it so we're accepted in whatever conversation we're going to have in rebuking Mary for what it is that she's doing. And we get to the place where we say, what does this cost? And at, at this point, when Judas, who had already prearranged to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he objected that this was a huge waste of money. That Mary used this perfume bottle, this huge quantity. As a matter of fact, he says in John chapter 12 and verse number 5, and then in Matthew's gospel also it unpacks the cost. But in John 12 and verse number 5, Judas said, this perfume was worth a year's wages. Also in, in verse number 5 of the New King James, it says, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? We go over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, and I'm not going to run the reference for you, but it's there if you want to study it for yourself to try to get an idea of what this cost. Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 12 talks about this coin that's called a denarii or denarius, right? And it was usually a wage for one day's labor. Now, since the Jews didn't work on the Sabbath or religious holidays, we can say this was 300 denarii, which would be equivalent to a one year's income. Theologians and scholars, they kind of differ a little bit here what this would come out to be in dollars for that particular day, but it's going to be somewhere around twenty to $25,000 for this oil that Mary had poured all of it on the feet of Jesus. Quite an extreme gift just to pour out. Would you agree? $25,000 that Mary spent in just a few minutes to worship and adore Jesus. My question to you is simply this. There it is, about $25,000. My question to you is, how would you respond to that? $25,000, Mary, that you just poured out on the feet of Jesus. Now, if you're a Christian and you've been a Christian a while, you've heard this story often, right? But we see this is a touching example of Mary's love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of us probably would have responded the same way that Judas responded here. And that's where I said earlier that many of us are probably more like Judas than we are like Mary. Because they were scolding her for wasting all of that money and all of that oil on this event that she was calling worship. You see, unlike Mary, we would have probably calculated the cost, right? Unlike Mary, we would have told ourselves, I'll just use a small portion of oil and worship him that way. I'll save the rest of it for later. Unlike Mary, we would have probably used a towel instead of using our hair. Obviously, I would have. <laughs> I used a towel instead of using our hair to dry the tears that had fallen on the feet of Jesus. I wonder, these are some questions that I have. What would it have been like to be like Mary? What would it have been to be Mary? To listen to all that she received. Listen, guys. In her act of worship, she loved Jesus. It was an extreme act of worship in what she did. But in that act of worship, she sensed this strong disapproval of all of the other guests that had been invited to that dinner. Mary, she heard this strong rebuke from Judas. And the other apostles, the other disciples that were there in the room also, they agreed with Judas on this, right? They were all rebuking her for the money that she spent in worshiping Jesus that day. But yet, she continued to pour out her love and her adoration for Jesus, even while she was being rebuked by the crowd. Now let that settle in. 
Sometimes we just hear that and we move on. No, no, let that settle in. I want to pause right there. I want you to get that. Everybody around her was rebuking her. Mary, what are you doing? She continued worshiping Jesus in the middle of the negative accusations and statements that were being thrown at her from the religious crowd. Now, everybody there was pretty religious, right? I mean, of course, I know Judas betrayed, but this dinner was in Jesus' honor. They loved him, right? They are, quote, unquote, religious people. They're the ones that are slamming Mary for doing what she's doing. Now, I'm going to go somewhere. This is, the rubber's going to meet the road here in just a minute. I'm just trying to set the stage, right? This is part two of my introduction. Right? I'm just trying to set the stage here. I want you to get this. Mary loved Jesus. Matter of fact, if you remember, Martha even went and complained. You remember the story here, right? Martha even went and complained to Jesus. I mean, she was busy. She was getting prepared to serve this meal and serve this dinner in Jesus' honor. And Mary's going to sit at your feet? Je Jesus, tell her to get up and help me. Right? But Jesus even rebuked Martha over that statement. How many of you are probably, don't raise a hand. I want you to think about this. How many of you may find yourself more like Martha than Mary? Just busy doing religious, spiritual stuff but really not engaging in extreme worship and loving God. I'm talking about the first part of our mission statement, love God. I think love God is going to involve some extreme worship that we're going to have for the Lord. I want to try to show you that in just a moment. I just said that. What was the response of, of Jesus? What was the response of Jesus? Let me go a little bit further here. What was the response of Jesus? Look in John chapter 12 and verse 7 and verse number 8. Jesus replied, leave her alone. We know what the response of Judas was. We know what the response of others in the room was. We know what the response of Martha was because Mary wasn't doing as much work as she was doing. So we know what those responses were. But what was the response of Jesus? In John 12 and verse 7 and 8, Jesus said, leave her alone. He went on and expounded on that, but he said, leave her alone. Guys, we need to be more focused on our extreme worship than we are in doing busy activities, even within the church. We need to be focused on what Mary was focused on and that is loving the Lord and having this extreme worship. So, to love God is to engage in extreme worship. Matthew 22, 37, first part of our mission statement. Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. So, I unpacked this, the scene there, right? I brought you into the room. I had you listen to what was going on. I had you smell the food and the fragrance of what was taking place. I had you see Mary. We listened again to the rebuke that she received from Judas and others. Then we listened to the response that Jesus gave when he took up for her and he said, hey, leave her alone. She's doing what she needs to be doing. So my question now is simply this. What can we learn from Mary about worship. I'm going to give you four things here. Four things. I'm going to close. I'm going to be pretty quick on these. Let me give you these four things. Four things that we can learn from Mary about worship. Extreme worship. Number one is simply this. Sit at the feet of Jesus. Let me ask you. Do you even do that? Do you have, even have a time in your life when you turn everything off? Whatever the distractions may be, your phone, your internet, the computer, the kids, the spouse, the TV, the ball game, the race, it's almost here. 
Daytona 500 comes in February, right? I love me some NASCAR. Turn all that off. Do you have, yes, bless his heart. I heard that. Who said that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a Southern thing. We just say that all the time. When you didn't really want to say what you wanted to say, you said, bless his heart. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't even know where I was. Oh, when was the last time? <laughs> Threw me there. When was the last time that you scheduled some time to turn everything off and just sit at his feet? Just listen. Read his word. Listen to him talk to you. You see, that's one of the things I love about the foundation study that we're doing. I'm just asking you to read one chapter a day. It takes 10 or 15 minutes. Turn everything off. Let the Lord speak to you through Scripture. And sit at his feet and worship him. We see Mary doing that in Luke chapter 10 in verse 38 and following. I've already read the scripture to you. I think I've got it here. But in verse number 39, that Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. We find that in Luke's gospel chapter number 10. And then in verse number, let me go to verse 40. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner that she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, that's his gentle rebuke, right? My dear Martha, almost like bless his heart. <laughs> my dear Martha. You are worried and upset over all these, everybody say details. Yeah. You ever get worried and upset over the details? We all do, right? We all do from time to time. I mean, even myself here at Victory Church, I'll walk around this building by myself and I'll see things that are distracted for me, maybe clutter, and I'm picking things up and I'm moving things around. I'm rearranging this and rearranging that and trying to make that look nice and wiping off that smudge. I mean, I just do that constantly all the time. Those little details, right? But maybe it'd be better to not worry so much about the details and sit at the feet of Jesus a little bit longer. Look what Jesus said in verse number 42. There is only one thing. Everybody say only one thing. Jesus said there is only one thing worth being concerned about. And Mary has discovered it. Wow, let that sink in. There's only one thing worth being concerned about, and Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. You know what she did? Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. She was sitting there. Mary was at the feet of Jesus, sitting there worshiping him. Martha was busy serving. And my question once again, are you more like Martha, or are you more like Mary? And let me ask you this. Do you long to sit at the feet of Jesus? Maybe there's some that go through your whole spiritual life and you're just Martha. Man, you're just working, 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 busy, 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 doing all this spiritual religious stuff and da 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 Now you're working for Jesus, but when was the last time you stopped being busy and you just sat at his feet? I think we've got to build that into our, in our calendar we got to build those moments into our day. And if you're like me, if it doesn't hit the calendar, it doesn't get done. Right? That's probably true of most of us. we got to build some time into our calendar on a daily basis to sit at the feet of Jesus. I'm talking about how we love God. I'm talking about lessons we learned from Mary. I'm talking about some things that she was doing that we could look at and put into our own life to help us love the Lord. One is sit at the feet of Jesus. Number two is this. Don't worry about what others think, right? So whenever you're engaging in extreme worship, you need to stop worrying what other people may think about you. As a matter of fact, most of us spend more time wondering what other people may think about us whenever it comes to our worship for the Lord, right? Whenever it comes to us walking in fellowship with Jesus. You see, we don't want others to think that we're being extreme. We don't want other people to think that we're being all emotional or that we're being all charismatic or that we're being all out of control, right? So we sit reserved. Matter of fact, 
There may be a moment in your worship experience here at Victory Church when Tyler's leading us in worship and the band is playing and the singers are singing and we're all standing up and we're singing. Maybe you have this feeling to just raise your hand. Close your eyes and just raise your hand. But no, we're like, oh, I better not do that. Uh, take a little holy peek over here and a little holy peek over there and somebody may see me do that, so I better stay reserved right here. <laughs> Hello? I remember one of the first times I ever raised my hand in worship. That's kind of the, the thought that Satan threw that fiery dart immediately right into me. <laughs> don't, don't, don't let them people see that. You worship within your heart. Right, keep it right here. You know what? Maybe there's a time that God is moving on you, and maybe you do need to raise your hand. You see, that's just a sign of surrender. Lord, I worship you. I honor you. I give all to you. I turn it all over to you. I just want you to know at Victory, it's okay to lift your hand in worship whenever we're worshiping. It's okay to clap. That's a form of worship. Maybe you're that and you're like, you can always tell those that are uncomfortable a lot, the half beat behind everybody, right? <laughs> you're actually drawing more attention to yourself by trying to be reserved in doing it than you would if you just did it, right? But here's the deal. We come to church and we're afraid to get too emotional in church, but yet we go to a ball game, we act like we've lost our ever-loving mind. <laughs> Hello? Over about who's going to win or lose a stupid ball game that means nothing at the end of the day. I mean, go win it all. Win the trophy. Win the Super Bowl. Win everything. At the end of the day, 99% of everybody's going to completely forget about that game. That trophy's going to tarnish, and you're going to go down the history book of a has-been that used to be in shape but now no longer are, and your team used to win, but no, like, maybe, maybe I'm describing a Cowboys fan. I don't know. But yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm just, just kidding. I'm, yeah. <laughs> My point is, listen, I, I'm kind of an emotional guy. If I go to a ball game, matter of fact, uh, we went to the ball game in Kansas City and watched our Tennessee Titans play. And so I'm, red is all around us. And me and Tyler and his girls and, and Megan, Debbie had on a house divided shirt. She had on half Kansas City and half Tennessee Titan, and Kristen and Will had on the Kansas City, and me and Tyler had on the, the Tennessee Titans, and I'm sitting all around, and man, Tennessee scores, and that, that first drive, or I don't know, first, first, second drive, but they scored a touchdown, they took the lead, I'm like, whoo! Everybody around me is like, <laughs> matter of fact, these people sitting in front of me look back at me, and I'm like, yeah, go Titans! Right? They score again, and man, I'm, and Tyler yells, hey! Where are all you Kansas City Chiefs now? Where's your little Tommy Hawk chalk now? You know, all they're doing. And, and T Tyler, I'm getting into it, and I'm standing up, and I'm screaming for the Titans, and I'm going crazy. And Tyler reaches over, and he, he says, Dad, he said, they take this stuff pretty serious around here. You, you, <laughs> you may want to settle. You may want to settle down a little bit, right? Well, the Kansas City came back, and they took the lead. Tennessee came back, and they took the lead. If you remember, the game went into overtime on Sunday night, and, and it was a great game. And, and uh, then there was one point where Kansas City was up, and, and I look over at Kristen and Will, and, man, they're, whoa, da, 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 da. You know, they're doing all this stuff. They're going crazy over there. And I, I'm like, what are y'all? Y'all crazy. Anyway, so then Tyler gets into it. We come back. Tennessee comes back and scores a touchdown. And Tyler, he, yeah, 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 and he's doing all, he's standing up doing all these things, and nudged him. I said, son, you may want to reserve yourself a little bit. These folks take it pretty serious around here. And matter of fact, there was one lady in front. Get this. Craziest thing. Can I share this with you? I don't know if I should or not. There was this family, this mom and dad and their daughter. They're all adults. The daughter was an adult and had a family and her husband. And, and uh, so craziest thing I ever seen. I didn't know they did this. But Kansas City scores their touchdown. They scored a touchdown. You know what these, this family of four did? The dad didn't. But I'm guessing he's the designated driver. But the rest of them, you know what they did? They reached in their purse. The grandma passed down to all the family these liquor bottles about like that, and they just killed them, the whole thing. I'm like, that's the craziest thing in the world I have ever seen. I'm like, how are they going to drive home? I'm watching the, right in front, the road right in front of me. I'm watching. I'm like, wow. And I tapped the grandma on the shoulder. I said, do you do that for every touchdown? <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to be able to walk out of here. And she said, no, we just do it for the first one. I said, well, that's a good thing. I was getting concerned about you guys, right? <laughs> My point is people go crazy at these ball games, right? And I'm okay with it. I mean, I have a good time too, right? I, I enjoy that. 
But we come to church and we're like, nope, got to stay reserved here. We are talking about worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're talking about worshiping Jesus who died on the cross for your sins and my sins. I got goosebumps running all up down my neck right now. If I had hair, it'd be standing up. <laughs> you know, we, we talk about, we're talking about Jesus who loved us, who died for us, who paid our sin debt, who redeemed us, who said, I'm going to supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. I'll be there through every circumstance that you go through. I'll be there on the highs of life. I'll be there in the lows of life. I'll I am Jesus. I am your Lord. I am your Savior. I am the Messiah. I am the Anointed One. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. And continue with all the I am's in Scripture. That's who we are worshiping, church. And I think there's some times when we need to get a little bit excited about that. And emotions are okay. Amen? Amen. Extreme worship. It's okay. We are worshiping the Lord. Ah, don't worry. Just don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry about what your neighbor may say. Don't even worry about what your spouse may say, right? Just worship the Lord. I want you to know that you're free to do that here at Victory Church. Number three is this one. Another lesson we learned from Mary is to love Jesus without limits. Simply love Jesus without limits. We need to I want to ask you a question. How much devotion to God is reasonable, right? I mean, we kind of look at everything and we put limits. We do this internal calculation and we determine how much is enough, right? We use that to set a limit on how much we're willing to do, on how much we're willing to give, and how much we're willing to serve. Are you with me, church? I want you to love Jesus without limits, Don't put any limits on it. If you feel like God's calling you to give and give and give, then give and give and give. Because I promise you, if God is calling you to give and give and give, he's going to bless you for it. Right? If God's calling you to serve and serve and serve, then honey, serve. Get in there and do what God is calling you to do. Don't put limits on what we're trying to do in our worship for the Lord. What is God calling you to do? What is he asking you to give? Then do it. Don't put limits on it. Mary loved Jesus extremely, right? Extravagantly. She loved the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you willing to give Jesus? Mary gave Jesus a year's wages. There it is, Lord. I worship you. Now, don't leave here and say that Pastor John asked me to go home and give my whole year's wages to That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is there were no limits, right? And oftentimes we limit what we're going to give. We limit what we're going to do. We limit how much we are going to serve. So let me ask you a question. What are your limits? Where are they? Evaluate yourself. This is just between you and God. What are your limits? I think you need to take the limit eliminator off. Right? Is that even a word? You you need to take that off. Right? You need to worship Jesus and honor him and serve him and do for him with out limits. Say, God, throw your hands up. I'm yours. I'm yours. And I love you. Well, number four is this one. Courageously follow the Lord Jesus. This is what I was telling you just a while ago, that following Jesus can be risky. It takes courage. It takes faith to look beyond what we can even see. Right? You see, I just believe by faith that Jesus died on the cross way back there for my sins. I've never seen him, right? I've never seen him. I know about him through his word. I felt his presence, but I've never seen him. But I've got faith that he did. I've got faith that he was buried and rose again victoriously. I've got faith that he's sitting by the right hand of God, the Father, there making intercession for me and for you. I can't see him, but I'm looking beyond that. I'm courageously following by faith the Lord Jesus Christ. And oftentimes we will pay a price to follow Jesus. And we usually do not know what that price will be. Now, there's a whole other story I could tell you right here. But there was a day that Debbie and I walked completely away from our dream home, our dream jobs, our dream career. I was driving a truck for UPS, had pension, retirement, insurance, like you wouldn't believe. 
She was working for the U.S. Postal Service, had pension and retirement and salary and everything as two young kids, no kid, no babies at all. Just we got married when we were 19 and we both had those jobs when we we're, were 20 years old. And I started working at UPS when I was 18, right after I graduated high school on the docks. And when I turned 21, started driving and stayed there for 10 years. I don't have time to tell you all of that, but it took some risk and it cost us some things. I remember when we had both of our kids while I was still working for UPS, I never paid a dime in insurance. Everything 100% covered. Now that's old insurance back in the day. <laughs> it's not like that nowadays, I know. We didn't pay a dime. The Teamsters Union I was a part of picked up every bit of it. Debbie had cancer. I have no idea what the bills were for that and her six weeks of radiation down at Duke Hospital and everything that they did for her never paid a penny. Insurance covered every dime of that. And then we said, you know what? God's calling us into ministry full time. And in doing so, let's see if you really love me enough to walk away from some of these things that are bringing you security. And we both hand in hand said, here we go. We're going to follow the Lord Jesus and did. And I can tell you so much more that comes into that. The point I'm trying to make is simply this. You being courageous and following Jesus by faith, it may cost you some things. But I promise you this. Whatever it costs you on the back end, it's going to be so much more worth it when you find yourself walking right in the center of God's will for your life and living out what he's called you to do and you loving him on a daily basis. It's going to be worth courageously following Jesus. I'm reminded in Luke's gospel, chapter 14, I need to stop. I, I just want to get to verse number 27. Actually, let me, let me back up and read this to you. Verse 26. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters. Yes, even your own, everybody say life. Even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is not saying that you turn around and intentionally hate every one of these people. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is, you can't put them before me. What he is saying is, you've got to worship me first, even before your own life. You can still love all these other people, but they've got, to, they've got to know, and you've got to know, that Jesus is the number one priority in your life, and then your family, right? And then your own life, and your own career, and whatever else, but Jesus has got to come first. And then he says in verse number 27 of Luke chapter 14, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. What do we know? And he's saying here, you got to carry your cross. Carry your cross and follow me. What do we know about a cross? We know that things die on a cross, right? Jesus died on the cross. And he's telling us to pick up our cross and follow him. And if we don't pick up our cross and follow him, we can't even be his disciple. What does he mean by that? Are we to go out and literally get a cross and just carry a cross? No, no, no. You know what he's saying? He's saying there's some things in your life you've got to die out to. Right? There's some things in your life that you've got to put second and third or whatever in priority. And he lists several of them. You've got to die out to some of those things. What is your dream? What are your goals? What are you achieving to be or become? Maybe, maybe God is saying you got to die out to that. Now, that doesn't mean you can't achieve it. It doesn't mean you can't obtain it. But you got to reprioritize the order. And you got to put Jesus first. That's a whole other message. But I just wanted you to see that. Let me jump through these verses here real quickly. I want to get down to verse number 33. In verse 33, he says this. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Now, once again, he's not saying go home and sell everything. He's not saying quit your job tomorrow. I don't know what God's calling you to do. But what he's simply saying, in your mind of priorities, you've got to reprioritize all that stuff. And you've got to put Jesus number one in worshiping and serving him. So my question to you is simply, what are you willing to risk for Jesus? Here are the four lessons that we learned from Mary Sit at the feet of Jesus. Don't worry about what others think. Love Jesus without limits. Courageously follow him. That's why I say the first part of our mission statement, to love God is to worship him. Right? To love God is to worship him. Jesus replied when asked, what is the greatest command? 
He says this, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. My question to you is simply this, do you love God? Are you engaged in extreme worship? Well, I hope you will. I hope you'll apply these four lessons from Mary into your own life. Let's worship God here at Victory Church. Let's love Him with all of our heart. Everybody say all. all. It's an important word. Everything. Pick up your cross. Die out to everything in your life. And follow Jesus and worship Him. To love God first and foremost means to have a relationship with Him. And the way you do that, you acknowledge yourself a sinner. And you believe that Jesus is the sinless Son of God. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and rose again victoriously. It starts in having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So my question to you, before you can even love God, you got to know Him. And the way you know Him is to be born again, to trust in Him.